And uh, we're in this series called A Healthy Family. And we've talked about how to have a healthy family, some of the things that you need to do. Uh, the first week, we talked about the foundation of it. We talked about that worship is the beginning. That's the foundation of building uh, a relationship with God in a healthy home. Uh, we've talked about marriage, and we've talked about how to discipline your children, how to raise kids. We've talked about how to have healthy money. Last couple of weeks, we've talked about that. Today, we're going to talk about something that all of us deal with, all of us need help with. We're going to talk about healthy communication. Have you ever felt like that sometimes you're saying one thing and somebody is hearing something else? Uh, it's hard sometimes to learn to know how exactly to communicate. But communication is incredibly important. How you communicate is very important. I heard about this old country boy. Um, he, during the pandemic, uh, remember when everybody was getting these checks from the government? Well, he got this check, and he was so excited. He'd never seen a check that big before. And uh, so he goes down to the bank, and he goes in. The first teller, he sees this nice man in a suit and tie, and he goes up and he slaps the check down on the counter. He says, cash that. And the teller looked at him. He said, well, I'll be happy to, sir. But first of all, you must endorse the check. And being an old country boy, he didn't know what the word endorse meant. And uh, he said, I ain't endorsing nothing. He picked the check up and goes down to the next teller. And it was a beautiful lady. She was all nice. Her hair was nicely done. She looked so professional. And he slaps down that check in front of that teller. He says, cash that. And she says, sir, I'll be happy to, but first of all, you must endorse the check. He grabs it up. He says, I ain't endorsing nothing, you people say. And he goes to the next seller, and this next seller was a former, former Georgia Bulldog player. He was a big old offensive lineman, six foot six, about 330 pounds. And he slaps it down in front of that big old teller, and he says, cash that. And the gentle giant looked at him. He said, I'll be happy to, sir, but first of all, you must endorse the check. And he said, I ain't endorsing nothing. And about that time, that big old offensive lineman reached across and grabbed that man and shook him like this. He said, I said, sign that check. He goes, oh, okay. And he just takes his pen and he signs the check. The guy cashes it. And on the way out, the first teller asked that old country redneck boy, he said, Sir, he said, I don't understand. Why did you cash, why did you uh, sign that check for that man and you didn't sign it for us? He goes, Oh, well, that's easy. He said, You didn't explain it like he did. So <laughs> sometimes you got to explain things, okay? And so today we're going to talk about how you can communicate biblically. I'm going to talk about three things today, very, very important, and I hope you'll uh, receive this and do what God's Word says. Uh, I'm going to begin in Proverbs chapter 18 and verses 19 to 21. Okay, I'm going to do it in three separate, all three verses separately. Uh, Proverbs chapter 18, begin with verse 19. A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city and quarreling like the bars of a castle. The idea there is that there's a barrier put up between you uh, from this offense. The word offend means to transgress against or to rebel against. And the idea is that you have intentionally offended someone. Now, it's, it's not dealing with the accidental offense. We all do that from time to time. This is the idea that uh, you have offended because of your carelessness, or because of your selfishness, you've offended this person with your words. And he, the Word of God says that if someone is offended like that, it is very difficult to win them back. Now, he's not saying it's impossible, but it is difficult. So what are some ways that we sin with our tongue, with our lips, with our words? Well, I think the number one way is that we lie. That's a sinful thing, not telling the truth. 
We don't control our anger. Now, understand, anger is not a sin in and of itself. It is uncontrolled, unbridled anger. Jesus got angry, remember, when he turned over the money changers' tables in the temple? Well, this was intentional. It was not out of control. And God gave you anger for a reason. You should be angry at sin. If you don't get angry when you hear about the sex slave trade going on in the world today, well, I wonder what your heart really is like, okay? Because that should make you angry. That's not sin, okay? Uh, but it's uncontrolled anger that is selfish and self-centered that is the sin. Uh, another way that we sin with our lips, with our words, is we manipulate. You ever manipulate someone? Moms, can I just say, and I love you, okay, but you're really an expert. God has given you that ability, all right, to be able to manipulate with your kids. I, know, I remember when I was about 14 years old, uh, we didn't have an automatic ice maker in our refrigerator, okay? We had the old ice trays. Anybody know what I'm talking about, the old ice trays, okay? And you'd have to fill it up, and you'd crack the ice trays, and you put the cubes in your sweet tea, okay? We're talking about the South, all right? So you put your ice cubes in your sweet tea, and then you'd have to fill up the ice tray and put it back in the refrigerator. Well, I remember uh, being a 14-year-old boy, my brain didn't operate properly, okay? And uh, so I went into the refrigerator because I drank a lot of sweet tea, and I got some ice, and I put the ice trays back in the freezer without filling them up with water. Oh, yes, that was a no-no, okay? And I'll never forget my mother. I was 14 years old. She comes into the kitchen where I am, sees that I had left the trays unfilled, and she went into mom mode. She goes, I went in, and I'm, I'm not kidding you, her voice was shaking. I went down into the jaws of death to bring you into this world. You would think that you love me enough to fill up the ice trays. And I'm like, geez, mom, what in the world, you know? But we manipulate sometimes with our words to get our way. Uh, we are selfish, we can abuse with our words, and there's many other things uh, that, and ways that we offend. Now, let me just tell you what this does not mean when it talks about being offensive or offending, okay? It does not mean that you should be thin-skinned and seek out offenses, okay? If you do, you need to read Psalm 119, verse 165, and I'm reading from the old King James Version. It says, great peace. Have they who love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And the point is this. When you get God's word in you, the more of God's word you get in you, the less offended you're going to be. Even during a political season like we've seen, and my goodness, the rhetoric is just absolutely astounding to me. But if you have God's word and God's spirit in you, you don't have to be offended all the time. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything. It just simply means that there are going to be some people that are just way, way out there, and you're not going to be offended by it in that, not that you agree with it, not that you are on their side, but rather you're not going to walk around uh, with your mind uh, just so damaged, and you have to have a safe space, all right, to get uh, ahead the next day. You don't get offended. You realize that offenses will come. Now, it also doesn't mean to create silly safe spaces. Now, what it, this does mean is that you can speak the truth, but you do it in love. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 15, speak the truth in love. Now, I know some people that speak the truth, but they don't do it with love. They don't do it with gentleness. They don't do it with grace. And you need to learn to speak the truth in love. Now, especially the truth of the gospel. Now, there are going to be people that you deal with that are offended by the idea that they need forgiveness. That Jesus Christ is Lord. 
There are some that are even offended at the idea of God. They are atheists. They say, I don't believe that there are very many true atheists. I believe that most people, when they're a kid, they believe in God. It's a natural thing to believe in God. The Bible says it's as natural as looking up at the sky. And the truth is, there are many that become atheists, ah, theists, without God. And the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now you say, are you calling atheists fools? Yes, I am. I'm not calling them stupid. I'm, uh, there are many highly intelligent people that don't believe in God. But the idea here is that we do not have to not speak the truth, but we do it in love. That is the truth of the gospel. Now, it does teach us that we should be wise in our speech, that we should speak with grace and wisdom and love, and that we should not be selfish or self-seeking, but that we should put other people's needs ahead of our own. Now, let let me just uh, address this a little bit when we're talking about communication. Uh, God has given me the privilege in my ministry to see, to win several, several atheists to Christ, okay? Okay. Uh, And let me just say this, you will not win an atheist to Christ by arguing with them or her. That's just not the way it's done. Uh, Just because you may win a point on a debate scale does not mean you have won a brother or sister in Christ, okay? Uh, So uh, when it comes to uh, our communication, it must be seasoned with love. We speak the truth in love. Well, let's go on to the next verse, verse 20. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied, and he is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Now, at first read, this seems like this proverb means you'll be satisfied when you speak good things. And that may be true, but that's not actually what this verse means, okay? Let me tell you what it means, and it's a little bit stinging. It's a little bit confrontational. Uh, The verse means, it's saying everybody likes their own opinion. Everybody thinks they are right. They get satisfaction from when they get proven right. They're up on their high horse, at least in their mind, okay? And, And what it's saying is that you need to get away from that kind of communication. The idea that... You know, it's you against the world, and you've always got to have the last word. You've always got to be right. Now, i got to be honest with you. Reading that verse and understanding what it means is a real kick in the seat of the pants for people like me. Because I was born right, okay? You know what I'm saying? I, I know that the world would be a better place if everybody just did what I said, all right? And if you want to know the answer to all the world's problems. Just listen to me. Now, I may not know what I'm talking about, but I've got an opinion on it, okay? And and this is what it's saying. Don't be like that. We all have this temptation, but that is not effective communication. And then the the last verse I'm going to read out of Proverbs 18 today, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. Now, what it's saying is that there's great power in your words. That you and I need to understand that our words give life or they crush people to death. You know this is true. It's true in a marriage. You can, with a simple word, make your husband just go off the deep end. You can, with a single word, crush the spirit of your wife. And and we do it with our tongue. We do it with our words. We can, with a simple word, crush the spirit of our children. And so he's saying that there is great power in your words. Your words either give life or they give death. Now, the last sentence there, and those who love it will eat its fruits, it means that you're going to reap the consequences of your words. That's what it means. And the truth is, you and I must be aware of the things we say because 
there are consequences to our words, okay? So if you want to learn what the Bible says, uh, rather than what your favorite news channel says, okay, and, and is it not crazy to watch the news and they, some of them, the ones that are on the winning side, they go crazy with some of the stuff they say, and then the ones on the losing side, they go even crazier with some of the things they say. Well, if you actually want to know how God's Word says we're to communicate as a Christian, healthy communication we're going to look at these three verses that we just read, and there's three points I want to give you. The, all these points come from each verse, and here they are. There is sinful speech, there is selfish speech, and there is strong speech. And so we all are guilty of these from time to time. We're all guilty of sinful speech. How do you get over that? You repent, you turn from it, okay? Okay. Uh, then we're all guilty of selfish speech. Sometimes we say things that are just purely selfish. But we all, according to God's Word, through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, can get better and have strong speech, the kind of speech that builds up. Well, let's look at sinful speech, first of all. 2 Corinthians 12, 20, and this is the Apostle Paul writing. He said, I fear that there may be discord. That's wrong jealousy. That's wrong. Not the right kind of speech. Fits of rage. Man, we all get angry from time to time in our speech. Selfish ambition. Slander. Gossip. Arrogance. And disorder. He's talking about feeding into the disorder. Now, how many times have we done that? We add, you know, a modern way of saying it, we add fuel to the fire. You ever just get in a conversation with somebody and it starts going off the rail and what do you do? You add fuel to the fire. He says, Paul said, I fear that those in the church are communicating in this way. And so by implication, God doesn't want us to communicate that way. Psalm 34 verse 13, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Man, speak the truth. Be truthful. Don't lie. Okay? James 1.26. If you... Now, this is where the rubber meets the road, okay? Where you have to examine your heart. He says, if you claim to be religious, and by this he's not just talking about religion in the way that a person that's not saved would talk about it. Oh, I'm, I, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. He's not talking about that. He's talking about being a believer. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself. Wow. And your religion is worthless. Wow. Isn't it amazing how we in the church, we, we pick particular sins and oh, those are the bad ones. Those are the, as long as it's not what you do, okay? But boy, we better not do that. And if you do that, you are, whoo, you're ungodly. Oh, you are going to hell. But isn't it interesting that we don't look at our own sin that way? He says, let's look at it again. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Who? That, that, that shaves close, doesn't it? Proverbs 18.8. And, and this is where this kind of comes to a head. Gossip is so tasty. How we love to swallow it. And... and I've seen this happen in so many ways, so many times in people's lives that they're couching their gossip in spirituality. I don't want you to tell anybody. I want you to pray about this, okay? <laughs> but did you see what she was wearing when she came to church, you know? <laughs> don't gossip. That is, according to God's Word, in fact, and I don't have it in the notes today, 
But that's one of the abominations that God hates. Now, isn't it interesting that some of the things that we call abomination today, God doesn't necessarily list as an abomination, and some of the things that we don't list as abominations, He does. Oh, Sister Jones now, she can be the busybody and gossip with everybody, but you better not disagree with her and her stance, or you are, you know, you're an outcast. Interesting how God deals with this differently than we do. So, sinful speech. Here's the second thing, is selfish speech. We're all guilty of this. Uh, Proverbs 18, 2. Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. Just selfish. Just not wanting to listen. James 1, 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone, if you get this, you'll get along with everybody much better. I would say that if you would... Apply this verse to your marriage, to your kids, to your job. We wouldn't really need very many counselors. That's what it says. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Man, wouldn't that change things? Wouldn't that make things different? Proverbs 18, verse 13, whoever gives an answer before he listens is stupid and shameful. Well, thank you, Solomon. That's what the word means. Now, you understand that we read in English translations, this is translation, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, New Testament was written in Koine Greek, and so what we read in these English translations, they're all, people ask, well, are these all different word of God? No. They're just different translations, and some of them are updated, and you get it in a way that you can understand it. That's the point of translating Hebrew and Greek into English. The point is to understand it. If you don't understand the Bible, it doesn't do you any good, okay? And I know a lot of people are like caught up in, let's use old translations that we don't understand. I would rather understand what the Word of God says. And so that's why we have different, that's why I use different translations. And you'll notice at the end, I put it in parentheses what translation it is. NIV, that's the New International Version. NLT, that's the New Living Translation. GNT, that's the Good News Translation. Um, and, so, and so forth. So uh, MES, that's the message paraphrase. All right. And so um, we're looking at selfish speech. Then he says, Proverbs 21, 23, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. Sometimes that's the best answer, isn't it? Just be quiet. I, I like the old saying, it's better to keep your mouth shut and have people wonder if you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Sometimes it's best just to be quiet, okay? Then Proverbs 21, uh, uh, 12 rather, verse 18, Proverbs 12, 18. Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. And by the way, I'll say this, what you and I need to do as believers, as Christians, we need to depend on the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will prompt you to say something to someone else. But I, I promise you, um, in doing that, you're going to speak words that are going to help them, not harm them. And so, let's go to the last uh, point. We've looked at sinful speech. We've looked at selfish speech. And then let's look at what the Bible describes as strong speech, the right way to talk. Proverbs 18, 21, words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. Now that's from the message paraphrase. So we get to choose whether our words are poison or helpful. Uh, Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Isn't it just so tempting to talk in a way that inflames? 
God says, sometimes a quiet answer, a gentle answer is the way to respond. Psalm 19, verse 14, and I love this one. Uh, Let the words of my mouth, this is a prayer of David, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And, And notice that he takes it up a notch. He says, let the words of my mouth. You can pray, God, let my words be right, and that's a good prayer. But if you want a better prayer, pray what David did. He said, Lord, not just my words, but my thoughts. Change the way that I think. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. God talks about that when you become a believer, He will change the way that you think if you let Him. Um, then 1 Thessalonians 5, no, I'm sorry, uh, let, uh, let me go to Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Now, that is not saying you don't ever tell somebody the truth, okay? What it is saying is that you use your words to build up, to let them know that God loves them, okay? Then Psalm 141, verse 3, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. If we prayed that, it'd be... It'd be good. We'd change our communication. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, So encourage each other. Part of your speech, your words, you know what God says to do? Encourage. Encourage each other and build each other up just as you are doing already. This church was doing it. And so my question for all of us is this. Are we following God's word? Are we using strong communication? Are we building up? Are we encouraging? Now, sometimes I do realize that a person has to be challenged, but God's Word tells us to use our speech, our language, to build each other up. Romans 12, 18, and um, this will be what we close with. Romans 12, 18, and I love how the Apostle Paul wrote this. By the way, uh, just from a purely literary standpoint, The book of Romans, as originally written, is one of the greatest pieces of literature in world history. Now, I realize it's the inspired word of God. But if you read this, just it is something to read if you're just like a communications major or an English major or a literature major, and you don't read the book of Romans, you're missing one of the most brilliantly written documents in the history of the world. Now, God used, Paul was smart. He was brilliant, and I like what he said, because he understood that sometimes you don't control, well, in fact, let me rephrase that, you never control what somebody else says or does. You can't control them, okay, but you can control you. So listen to what he said. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, so he's saying that not everybody's going to communicate the right way. Some people are going to be offensive toward you. Some people are going to try to harm you. Some people are going to try to hurt you. But he says, as much as it depends on you, if it's possible, live at peace with everyone. That's what he says. So as much as it depends on you. Now, let me give you a few practical applications, and we're going to pray. Conflict is inevitable. Okay? Uh, Conflict, no matter what relationship you have, it is inevitable. Why? Because we're flawed human beings, okay? And so you need to prepare because there will be conflict. Don't be surprised by it when someone says something. Be committed. Number two, you need to give and receive grace. Now, sometimes people just have a bad day and they say stuff. I've seen it ruin friendships, I have seen it derail deep Christian partnerships. Um, my best friend uh, is Gene Wolfenbarger. He pastors in uh, Sevierville, Tennessee. He and I have been friends since we were about 23 years old. And 
Um, he and I, we've done so many things together. We are dear close friends. I've been an encouragement to him. He's been an encouragement to me. And I've heard him say this, and I've said this about our relationship. I've said if it weren't for him, I'd be out of the ministry today because he encouraged me. He kept me going. He said the same thing. So God's used our friendship in a great way. But when we were young, I don't know, probably our late 20s, uh, we took our families we didn't have all the kids that we have now, but we took our families to Disney World. Disney World, the happiest place on earth, they say. <laughs> and evidently, we missed that memo because at the end of the day, and I guess we were hot and tired and thirsty and hungry, and uh, he and I, we got so upset with each other, we two preachers, two men of God, stood in the parking lot of Disney World and almost got into a fist fight. Now, what is my point? You need to learn how to give grace and receive it. Thankfully, we did. We apologized later. We said, you know, I don't know what came over us, and we got better, okay? And the point is this. You need to learn to give and receive grace because there are going to be offenses. There are going to be times when you don't feel well. There are going to be times when somebody says something that just flips your switch and just makes you angry, Okay? So give and receive grace. And then finally, and this is it, daily prayer and Bible reading helps. I've noticed that when I meet this kind of speech that is offensive, if I'm full of God's Word and I've prayed and I've really thought and meditated on the Word of God, I'm less likely to get angry or to lash out or to respond negatively. So the point is this. Read the Bible. Pray. And pray what David said. Let the, the thoughts and meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. And when you do that, I believe you'll communicate better. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to communicate properly according to God's word and with your grace. In Jesus' name, I pray. Now, before we look this way, I want to do um, just a couple things. Number one, I want to pray for you if you need Jesus. If you need salvation, if you're not sure that you're saved, I want you to tell God about it. He always listens. He will save you if you'll ask. And you can just say something like this to God. Lord, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sins, and I receive your finished work. I'm not trying to be a good person to go to heaven, to earn your love. I'm trusting in your grace. And if you'll say that to God, he'll save you. And if you do that, let us know. Put on your next step card that you pray to receive Christ today, or come by at the end and pray with one of our prayer team members. Secondly, I want to pray about this. Are you having conflict with someone? Is there some fallout that has happened? Can I pray for you? No one looking but me. You'd say, Pastor, I've got a conflict I need help with. I need God's help in my life. Okay, many of you are raising your hand. Lord, I pray that you would just help us um, to forgive, to be able to deal with conflict, to be able to use strong speech, not selfish speech, not sinful speech. And we thank you. I want you to look right this way. Um, last thing I want to say is, if you've got conflict... If your words have hurt someone or someone's words have hurt you, deal with it before it gets out of hand. The longer you let it go, the more it festers. You know, the Bible tells us this when it says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. And the idea is that if you'll deal with it the same day that it happens, you're more likely to get over it. You're more likely to receive forgiveness. You're more likely to give forgiveness. Deal with it now. That's the point. And so my prayer for you is that you will do 
just that and have healthy communication. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come. You can put your next step card in the offering bucket at this time. Uh, you can put your offering in there if you would like. And uh, so whatever prayer request you may have or whatever, you put that in uh, the offering bucket as it's passed just now. Now, let me remind you, you can give in four ways. You can give when the buckets are passed. You can give online at stillwaters.online. You can give by texting the number 84321, or you can give on the app. And if you don't have the app, but you'd like to get the app, then there is a teal colored card on the right as you walk out through the lobby and grab one of those cards and it'll walk you right through how to get the app. Some things about our phones are wonderful, aren't they? And some things are like you want to throw it in the middle of the ocean, all right? And I have some of those moments. Maybe it's because I'm getting old. But uh, anyway, hopefully you will uh, you download that app and you can use it. It'll be a great blessing to you, okay? Looks like we're finished. Uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you. I love you. God bless you for being here today. We'll see you next Sunday.